Congratulations to all of you for your enormous endeavors for a better world and give a short message of hope, as mentioned by Professor Hirschfeld. The whole world is in transformation and will change mainly through politics, economics, education and awareness rising. We are moving in a completely new era of synthesis, peace and harmony and are now experiencing the birth pains of a new civilization. That is why my Maitreya, the world teacher for all humanity, for people of all faiths and for those of none, and architect for the global transformation, as well as 14 masters of wisdom are now in the world, ready to guide us through this difficult transition. They will also raise awareness by teaching us to know who we are, where do we come from, where are we going, and that we are souls in incarnation, journeying together on a long path of evolution, till we become masters ourselves. When we become aware that we have been living and will be living in different continents, sometimes as a man, sometimes as a woman, experience all the colors and different religions, then we no longer need all this hatred, racism, separatism, violence, and violence against women, and understand that these are all conditionings which we can overcome and let go. However, they cannot just come and interfere with our free will. They need an invitation to work openly together with humanity. Let us therefore now invite our Lord, by whatever name we may call him, and the Master, so that they may come and help us create a new world of sharing, trust, justice, cooperation, peace, abundance for all, uh, for all human beings. Loka. Samasta Sukino Bhavantu. May all the people in all the worlds be happy. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Peace within us, peace within the nations, and peace in the whole world. I thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Um, now I would like to give the floor to the distinguished representative from South Africa. Did I see you there? Thank uh, you very yeah, much, Chairperson. Allow me to thank the presenters for their contribution and make some brief comments. Yesterday, we learned of the 185 Israeli settl settlements with the more than a well, couple of hundred thousand s illegal settlers in an occupied territory in Palestine. We also heard presenters making reference to the situation on the ground in Palestine and comparing it to that which existed in South Africa under apartheid. Chairperson, if I can make a remark, before apartheid ended in South Africa, the odds were that Palestine would be free before South Africans were liberated from the clutches of the apartheid regime. We know that it was otherwise. Direct dialogue through political will and visionary leadership worked in favor of South Africa. Chair, if you allow me to draw on Mr. Nathan Stock's inputs focusing on the revitalization for the quartet and, the, and that the fact that despite the power of the United States, the money of the EU, and the moral authority of the UN, the quartet has achieved very little by way of peace in Palestine and Israel. The absence of progress, or rather the erosion of progress since Oslo, seems to suggest a spectacular lack of progress on the part of the quartet. Support for a two-state solution has been established over and over, even in this conference. For now, 
There is this one outcome that all of us here appear to agree on. However, the notion of quartet leadership as it is presently constitu constituted is being questioned, and rightfully so, for the lack of progress that it has achieved on this issue. One can understand why, because the situation on the ground has continued to deteriorate in the territories, knifings and shootings continue unabated, settlement activity and settler violence has escalated, security and peace for Palestinians and the Israelis remains elusive. So the question must be, where does this leave us as the international community? Should we continue to delegate our coll collective aspirations and responsibilities in this matter to the quartet? Are we expecting or anticipating different results? That would be illogical, maybe even slightly foolish. Perhaps the time has come where member states need to assert our role in this process by virtue of the UN's inclusion into the quartet, we as members, in essence, have our representation in that quartet. And by the same virtue, the UN provides the quartet with its moral legitimacy as the representative of the international community. So let's step back a little and ask, as, Mr. as I understood, Mr. De Soto has also alluded to, uh, where is the referee in all of this? C could you pose your question if there's any? Please, we're stressed on time. I, if you'll indulge me, thank you, Chair. Or even who is the referee? If we claim that role for the UN, then how does the UN act as both player and referee? We have heard the mention of the success of the P5 plus one in the case of Iran, the process that culminated in the JCPOA between the P5 and Iran was, what, was that its outcome was endorsed through the U UN resolution, which asserted one, the moral and legal weight of the UN, and two, the coercive nature of Security Council resolution application, which compelled the parties to abide by its resolution. These are the questions that we need to think about. Failure to act in terms of the multilateral legal framework will result, uh, result in the further extension of the status quo, and which means that the continued illegal op occupation, suffering and insecurity for both Israelis and Palestinians will continue. Therefore, bringing the matter back to the UN by way of another Security Council resolution may be necessary to kickstart a moribund process on the basis of international legality and accountability. The ideal, of course, would be for the quartet to be expanded to ensure more representativity <coughs> of those members, member states which can assist the process. We, as member states of the UN, must assert for the broadening of the process using international legal options through the UN, rather than limiting the Palestinian-Israeli peace process to the quartet, quartet process. And that is what I would like to say, and 
Chairperson, I thank you for your indulgence. Thank you very much. And I, this is the last speaker now. Uh, if could be uh, quite short, uh, Professor Golan, uh, you have the floor, and I'm going to give uh, for, because we are we are really running on, on ti out of time here. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to refer a little bit to uh, the comments from my colleague uh, Yael. The, the statistics certainly show, the polls have been very clear year in and year out. There is a majority in Israel and also in the Knesset for the two-state solution. But as I mentioned earlier, the statistics are also very clear that the vast majority do not believe it's possible. And I think that's why they go for a right-wing, strong government because they believe peace is impossible. But what we heard, I think, from Yair is something um, very indicative of where we are in the peace camp in Israel. We are looking, looking for what to do, how to turn, how to galvanize or mobilize or turn that majority into something very real and particularly into a, a political force or an electoral force. And so we talk about how to get to the settlers, how to, how to get the settlers out, how to reach the religious public, um, creating a new organization. I hear there's still another new one. Every, almost every other day there's another peace organization set up, another group that's working. These are all indicative of uh, what we're struggling to do. I don't agree with all of these seven uh, ideas that uh, Yair and his group have come up with. Maybe some of them will work, maybe not. I happen to believe the international path is much more serious and, and has a greater potential for success. But I wanted to point out that all of these things, this is absolutely indicative of where we are today in the peace camp in Israel. We are looking for ways. We're simply looking for ways, and they may be, maybe sound crazy, and maybe, as I say, I don't agree with them all. But I do want to say one thing. Somewhere along the line, I think it was in the 1980s, Yair Hirschfeld came to me with a proposal for something to do in the West Bank. And I looked at him and I said, this is so totally off the wall, it's unrealistic. And several years later, this fellow turned up in Oslo as one of the architects of this tremendous breakthrough in terms of mutual recognition and a path forward. So, I don't dismiss him anymore, and I don't dismiss his ideas anymore. I know he's looking the same way that I'm looking, and maybe maybe one of these will work. Thank you. Uh, now um, I shall give the, the panel to answer. Each has three minutes and a half, so starting from far right over there, uh, Mr. Ode, and uh, just direct to. الإخوة الحضور بالنسبة للسؤال حول الاعتراف بإسرائيل كدولة يهودية الدول تعترف ببعضها البعض وليس بالمبنى الدستوري لبعضها البعض وأعتقد أن المتفاوضين جاءوا ليتحدثوا عن حقوق الشعب الفلسطيني وليس عن حقوق الشعب اليهودي التي حققت بعشرات السنوات الأخيرة الفكرة الأساسية من هذا المطلب هو الاعتراف بالرواية الصهيونية الاعتراف بالأيديولوجيا وليس فقط الاعتراف بالدولة وهذا مهين للشعب الفلسطيني الشعب الفلسطيني وصل إلى هذه المعادلة عبر عدة سنوات كجزء من مصالحة تاريخية وليس نقاش حول الحق وإنما في نهاية المطاف يوجد شعبان هنا ونحن نريد للشعبين أن يعيشا بكرامة وبأمن وأن يعيشا بدولتين مستقلتين ولكن أن يطلب أي طرف من الطرف الآخر الاعتراف بروايته التاريخية بأيديولوجيته هذا أمر فائض عن أي معنى وواضح أن الهدف هو عرقلة العملية السلمية هناك سؤال ماذا يعني دولة يهودية؟ هل هناك اتفاق في إسرائيل حول معنى كلمة دولة يهودية؟ 
أصلا بإسرائيل غير متفقين على ماذا يعني من هو اليهودي الشخص فهل هم متفقون ماذا يعني دولة يهودية هل ميرس تتفق مع المتدينين اليهود حول تعريف يهودية الدولة هل المتدين المستوطن القومي يتفق مع يائير لبيد يش عتيد حول معنى يهودية الدولة أم هم يريدون للشعب الفلسطيني أن يوقع على ورقة بيضاء وعندما يتفقون بعد 30 سنة بعبوا الورقة البيضاء هذا مطلب مسيء وطبعا رفض فلسطينيا المفاوضات هي حول الاعتراف بالدولتين وليس حول الاعتراف بالقضايا الداخلية بالدولتين مثلا لماذا لا يناقشوا قضايا المهجرين العرب داخل إسرائيل أيضا هي قضية داخلية وتتعلق بالصراع وتتعلق بالعام 48 لماذا إسرائيل تنتقي ماذا يتحدثون وماذا لا يتحدثون هذا منطق مقلوب على رأسي هذا منطق مسيء لهذا فلا يوجد أي معنى للتعاون مع هذا الموضوع ولكن أنا أريد أن أخصص جوابي العين حول ما سأله دكتور محمد اشتيا وهو ما هو تأثير هذا الأمر علينا نحن العرب الفلسطينيين المواطنين في دولة إسرائيل أولا كفكرة الطبيعة أن يطلب المهاجر من الأصل المساواة في بلد الأصل أو الأصلاني نحن أهل الوطن نطلب المساواة مع اليهود مطلب الدولة اليهودية يعني أن نوافق أن نكون أقل من اليهود في وطننا نحن هذا أمر ليس أنه خطأ سياسي هذا أمر مسيء أخلاقيا لكرامة الإنسان كرامة الإنسان تجدو المساواة تنشد العدل أما أنا ابن الوطن أن أوافق على أن أكون مواطن درجة ثانية في دولة اليهود وليس في دولة كل المواطنين فهذا بالطبع مهين ومسيء أيضا هذا القبول بهذا المبدأ يفتح الأبواب على مصاريعها أن تناقش قضايا مثل التبادل السكاني أن يطرد أهل المثلث أو أن يبدل أهل المثلث العرب وهم داخل إسرائيل بالمستوطنين اليهود الذين هم داخل الضفة الغربية وطبعا هذا المنطق معادي لكل ما هو عربي لماذا أهل المثلث ولماذا ليس أنا لأنني ابن مدينة حيفا أعيش بين اليهود فلا يستطيع أن يضع الحدود بيني وبين جاري اليهودي فيقولون أولا المثلث وأنت بعد ذلك سيكون دورك في التخطيط القادم الفكرة هي أقل ما يمكن من المواطنين كلمة مواطنين المواطنين العرب لهذا فهذا الطرح والمطلب يجب أن يرفض كليا وأنا واثق أن كل من يسمعني هنا يدرك بأن هذا الكلام سليم شكرا Uh, thank you. Now I, I would like to give the floor to Mr. De Soto. There was a question from Mr. Staye. So you have, you have the uh, floor. Yes, I think it was more in the nature of a comment than, a, than, a, than an actual question. I, I, I fully understand the sort of the, the dilemma uh, that uh, you faced, and it is a, a rather sui generis case in uh, the study of comparative conflict resolution efforts. There is no doubt as regards the asymmetry between Israel and the Palestinians that is established. And it, it is also established that the United States does not claim to be uh, impartial uh, in the sense that, say, the Norwegians uh, are. Uh, I was, have always understood that uh, the Palestinians, despite these uh, drawbacks, uh, accepted a U.S. role uh, because uh, they felt that only the U.S., if anyone, can deliver Israel at the end of the day. I'm not sure whether that's true anymore, but I always understood that that was where you were coming from. That's how I always assumed it. 
uh, more or less in the same way, also asymmetrical, that uh, Israel uh, is confident enough uh, that the uh, United States will not, uh, let's say, sell them down the river. That's what I, I, I've always assumed. But, I mean, it's up to the Palestinians to decide who they accept and to the Israelis uh, uh, as well, and also as to the terms of reference of the uh, mediator. Now, as I understand it, the uh, French uh, exercise, I don't see as um, a third party role in the sense that one might have expected the Norwegians or the US or other uh, mediators to carry it out. As I see it, and that is one possible useful contribution that could be made at this time, which is probably not very propitious for negotiations, that the Security Council should, uh, that, that this, this was in preparation for the Security Council laying down hopefully within the next few months, uh, the parameters within which a solution should occur. Uh, a Security Council vision of final status, as it were. We will accept the Security Council will support a solution if it is within these parameters, a statement of that nature. On, along the lines of Resolution 435, regarding Namibia. Not something that the Security Council was trying to impose at the time. It took 10 or 11 years for it to be put into practice. But there was a blueprint ready when the time came. Or like Resolution 598, which opened the door uh, to the acceptance uh, by Iran uh, of a ceasefire with uh, Iraq. That I would see as a useful role to be played by the Security Council. Uh, may I take advantage of this in less than 30 seconds, Mr. Chairman, to ask a question of my own to Yair Hirschfeld? And it is, uh, having regard to uh, the fact that, uh, in a sense, Oslo was sort of the firing gun for the start of an exponential growth in settlements in occupied Palestinian territory. Um, is he as happy with the result uh, constituted by Oslo today as he was then? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, there are not only that, there are so many questions to you here, but uh, I would hope that three and a half minutes and... Uh, I have to do in three and yes, minutes. and uh, later on I will give Mr. Folkman... Uh, I'll answer in, in Telegram. Um, do I think that we can work with this government, the present Israeli government? The answer is we have to work with our present government in order to change the government. And I can explain you what I mean. The second question, is, is there a majority in Israel for a two-state solution? I only want to tell you that the IDF came out in September um, 2015 with a strategic policy paper of the IDF which represents the majority of the Israeli people and says we want a two-state solution. It says clearly we have to have the peace process with it. We have to go along with it. I can tell you that on the third question on economic prosperity in the West Bank and in Gaza, there is a majority in the what we call in, in the governmental institutions, even of a lot of right wingers, part of it, of the Mossad, of the Shabak, of the IDF, um, of the Ministry of Finance, of all of it, and there is there is a lot of activity, and you have Minister Kahlon definitely in favour of it. And the question is, when will he take when will he take the key in order to make this really happen? But it is an important thing where there is substantial support for it. On the fourth question. I didn't, I, my remark on sections, you cannot expect the Israeli peace camp to go against Israeli interests. The Israeli peace camp has to build itself, as has to be seen as the promoter of Israeli interests. And therefore, 
I think we can use we can use the expression we need disincentives and incentives for both sides. I agree, may agree with you that on some issues we need a little bit clap on the shoulder and do things and we can speak more about it. Number um, on sanctions. Number five, um, we should have negotiations on the role of a third party. I think we need an understanding on the role of third party. We need some input of the role of third party. We have fears. I can tell you the fears we have. We have a lot of, a lot of experience on that. I can tell you that in Norway, Abu Allah and I asked the Norwegians to be out of the room. Um, and, but we have, it may be different today. We may need more input of the third parties and we'll have to think about it. Um, on this, by the way, Mr. De Soto, we yesterday heard the, the um, very honorable representative of Egypt. He says, we have got two for two. Don't, interven don't interf in create another security resolution that will not be done. So only on that, the third parties, they're very, very important. And we'll have to listen not only to ourselves. Um, on, the, uh, on the settlement issue, um, I'm grateful for, for your remark. There is an elephant in the room, and these are the settlers. And this is also an answer to you. Um, I would be very happy. I would be very happy if we would have, um, if Carter would have insisted in 1978 on that there has to be a settlement freeze, and that he wouldn't have permitted Menachem Begim to speak of Judea and Samaria, but of the West Bank and of Gaza. And he didn't. And um, I, I can tell you that in, I can go far more about that. We always wanted to find a way in order to how to, to control the settlements. But we need to speak about how to get this ele elephant out of the room. And um, if I think that Oslo was a mistake because of this, maybe there were things that could have been done better. Um, we had uh, some other ideas that were not carried out. But Oslo failed not only because of us. And the settler thing doesn't fail only because of the Israeli side. This is far more complex, and it would be, it is a little bit demagogic to make this remark, and I must say I, I resent it. Um, now, um, on, the fifth, on the next question, the Arab Peace Initiative, um, we have the Arab Peace Initiative. We have a very important paper that has been concluded by Mr. Medani and by Kobe Huberman. And, um, I don't think this is exactly acceptable, but it is a basis to think how to make the Arab Peace Initiative work. And we definitely can speak about it and think about it, how to make this um, operational. Um, um, I think uh, one thing on Mrs. Hannah Brown, Hannah Bron Bronner, um, I would love to listen to you and see why, um, and maybe we can help in, um, in, in, in seeing why you're on the blacklist and if we can help to, to alert this. I'm happy to meet afterwards with you. And maybe we've done these things in the past. Sometimes we're successful, sometimes no. But we normally know we, we know, we do get an answer from our officials why the position is taken. And then if we can di have a dialogue about this, we may have a way to deal with it. Thank you. It was as quick as I could. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's excellent, quick telegraphic. I think Mr. Walkman, uh, not concluding, but you want to say something? No. Right, uh, because uh, he also have uh, engagement. But of course, uh, on the question of the youth, uh, later on you can have the bilateral also uh, with, with her. Right. Now, now, with that, I think we have uh, concluded because uh, I was informed by the, the secretary that uh, uh, the time has uh, run out. And this certainly concludes our deliberation of Plenary 3. Uh, and on behalf of the committee, I would like to express our uh, deep appreciation to the distinguished speakers who shared their knowledge and experience. And on, of course, um, there are ample opportunities to have uh, more in-depth discussion uh, through coffee. Uh, but I was, since we are a little bit out of time, um, rather than have a, a coffee break, I was informed that we have a quick changing of the panel. And for those who would love to have coffee, coffee is still outside. Hopefully, it doesn't change to milk. But once again, <laughs> uh, uh, I think the secretary can change. And once again, a round of applause to everyone here that has spoken. <laughs> and with that, I conclude my job. And I give back the floor to my chairman, uh, Excellency. Thanks so much.